are brainstorming on which approach to take. And talking a bit about Java server faces, I'm not expecting everybody to be familiar with Java server faces. Though it's a two or three year old technology already, it's not so that <coughs> many people who actually work uh, on a business application have the time to use a Java server faces. So we'll cover a bit of the basic fundamentals of Java server faces. And then, of course, how can that technology be used to AJAX enable your, uh, your applications? Later, then, as an example, I will show you AJAX Faces with Find Component, which is a component set that we released with JDevelop 11. It's not that I want to try to sell you AJAX Faces components. Of course, if you give me the opportunity, I sell it to you. But um, it's just an example because we know that many vendors, JMark, just as an example, use a similar approach in uh, embracing the AJAX world. So, what is AJAX? Um, as I said, I'm not going into deep detail, so I'm not showing you the coding behind that, because I think the coding is really not what the developer should see when you build business applications. Yeah. So, if you're a geek, a propeller head, if you like low level coding, then of course you want to see the external HTTP request object, you want to see the JSON objects floating around, and that gives you a very good time to see that happening. But if you're on a business project, if you want to be productive, if you want to build a banking application, your manager doesn't care uh, how much of the objects you see. Right? Anyway, so the base idea of AJAX um, is that there's an asynchronous communication happening between the browser and the server, which is important to spare you the page refresh. In traditional web applications, to update a screen or to just show no new additional data, you have to do a full page refresh. So it's going to the server, asking for a new page with all the updates. Now, asynchronous communication was made possible thanks to Microsoft, you have to admit, because they first came up with an ActiveX object that allowed you to call the server without actually using the URL for that. And then all the other browsers were following up, and eventually now in IE7 and 5.0, we find the same object handling the server <coughs> communication by the client. Web 2.0 is the overall umbrella term, so that's basically all. Uh, embracing all technologies that we want to build rich applications, whatever rich means. So you make up your mind, I have my idea of what rich means. Uh, mostly it means make a lot of money in a short time. But Web2 always the overall goal that we have, or another term would be rich internet applications. So we want to have a very nice, interactive user experience with our application. And that could be implemented in many ways. You could use Flash, you could use uh, uh, Microsoft.net technology, you could use whatever you find just to make an application behave more responsive. Now, one implementation technology for that is Ajax. So Ajax, the combination of technology it contains, is one implementation option to go for a written application approach. One of the nice little things to say about Ajax is that because of its uh, nature, it's not depending on the programming language. So even if you decide for Ajax as a programming approach, you have different technologies that you can use to build the uh, business level code. One option is to use Java for that. You can also use PHP, .NET. It's up to you and your skill set what you want to use to implement the business level. But one thing is for sure, Ajax is very good on the client side, but you want to put business logic on the client side. You want to have some kind of smart middle tier layer that then the communication has to be nice to. And that brings into the thinking, now how do I handle my life cycle? And who is handling the life cycle? Now who is keeping state? Where do I put state? Should I put state on the client? Or what happens if someone reloads the page accidentally? Will this all be flashed out? <coughs> Things like that. That will all come when you start on thinking how to implement Ajax in that. Now, technology-wise, if we look at Ajax, and Ajax is nothing else than just an acronym for a set of technology we had for a long, long time. JavaScript was always the unloved child of developers, right? Well, no, developers love a, uh, JavaScript as a child, right? So they like to toy with it, play with it, nice little funky animations on the client, but actually companies never liked JavaScript because there was so so much fun around it, so much uh, misconception of how dangerous JavaScript would be, cross-site scripting, security, very we'll talk about uh, this afternoon about security in Ajax, but we will cover some of the JavaScript news about security. So it wasn't really loved by companies to use JavaScript, but in the end it proved to be very effective in terms of uh, building rich internet applications. Then of course the document object model, which is just a memory tree that you have on the browser side that allows you to do direct manipulation of components 
So instead of just reloading the page, you can say, okay, there's a text field, change that for me. Or there's a div element in my page, find it, get it, put this content in. And that's the, the secret of asynchronous work. So you send a request to the server, you get to payload back some information that you want to show to the user, and then you only use the DOM, identify the area where you want to put the information, and you can squeeze it in. So the user is like, bam, yeah. All of a sudden, the information is there, and he feels very pleased because that reminds him of the desktop days. And that's all that we're doing, right? This industry is doing, I think, the last 20 years trying to build with new technology what we have with old technology for years. Yeah, so we first tried to get rid of client server, and now we're trying to get client server back into the browser. So actually, we're trying to really uh, fight the user experience, and the user is actually driving the business. Yeah? We can drive technology, but the user is driving the business. Where's no, where there is no business, there is no technology, right? So we have to follow what the user wants. So let me show you one example. Um, before going into the detail of how that is built, just to give you an impression of how how that would look like. Um, show you the slides. This example is built with an older version of JDeveloper that takes a bit longer. So I do the end, I end user entertainment right now, so instead of showing the flash screen. Uh, now what the example will do, it will show you some of the functionality that you would expect from an Ajax application, or what actually users would expect from an Ajax application. So things like scrolling, in-place searching, and so on, right? So let's, so now, the real splash screen comes up. And I will later on show you how that example is built, the components that are behind that, why we think that using Java server based for such an application simplifies the asking a lot. Plus, I will show you the number of um, components we provide for that. Oh, you see. There's always one presentation that fails. This time it's the first. Yeah, we pay the same penalty for starting it up again. So, <clears throat> what users want? Users want to have flexibility to have in um, desktop applications. That is like moving columns as they please, remembering how they move columns in a table as they please, filtering data as they please, um, resizing columns as they know from Excel. Uh, they like to have um, partial page rendering where possible, not refreshing the page, paying the penalty of any kind of network delay. They want to have the ability to get data to the client as they scroll to an application, not you to give them one million records at a time and then, yeah, filter it yourself on the client so it would be just slow. So this is actually what users are looking for, plus, and uh, you won't believe how important that is, a very nice looking UI, something very interactive, something that's just flashy, right? You can't go with a traditional Web, uh, web looking application in Ajax style or in the written internet application. People expect at least some kind of animation uh, because they're used to that. So, this is um, my little application. So, one thing you recognize when I move over a movie, I see a pop up coming up. So, that's a date HTML pop up that someone has to code. Now, if you do a plain Ajax approach, it would be you to code. Then, of course, what everybody wants is drag and drop working, right? That's what everybody wants. This is a gesture that we know from uh, rich clients, from desktop clients. People are used to sort, shift around, and drag and drop, and so they want to have the same on the web. They also want to have context menus that are smart enough so that the developer can put in, you know, what do you want, dynamic context menus. They also want to be able to search. Let's search for, well, first let's search for all categories just come up with a different view. And what you would see is, I'm just refreshing the uh, view of the images right now, so I will replace it by a table. So 
you see, now this one is fetching um, 1,500 records, not, not bringing them to the client, but fetching them from the Docker database. And you see, I have the same view of movies, but now I do have a scroll pane. If I do it a bit quicker, now let's see if I can multi-pass in its label. You see that? It tells you exactly which row I'm at without really fetching the row. And that is what users would expect. Not that they know what row 1,200 is. But actually, they know that uh, if you know you have a table that fills stuff in a sorted order, they know that they need to go to C, so they have a very good feeling for how much many records that could be. But you, in fact, want to use search for that. And the search could be either a client side filter or it could be a server side filtering. It comes back now with smart filters. So that's just the impression of an Azure certification. Of course, you could do a lot more uh, in terms of um, fancy examples. Now we'll show you the set of components we have in a minute. Let me just start another workshop, Jay, but I'll then continue. So that was just a brief introduction to what is Ajax. So we want to have a bridge. Everybody wants to be rich. Even, even I want to be rich, right? But I don't want to be from JavaScript. I want to be rich with money. So approaching Ajax, now you're the developer. Your boss uh, comes after this session and says, well, I visited the developer summit, you know, that was so great. Everybody told me things floating around and built me the same. <laughs> now it's, <laughs> now it's, it's the same like uh, people who come, uh, who visit headquarters, Oracle headquarters, and you know, have a very good time, speed boat driving with Larry, um, having very good meals with Larry and all the people, they come back buy software for $2 million and here implement it. And that's you then, right? So you would have to start with an approach. So one thing is just ask you some questions. What would you expect from an application? What would the user expect from an application? And you kind of have thousands of different knots rotating and doing fancy stuff, but does that really uh, support the application that you have to build? So try to get an idea of the functionality you really need. Because that would help you to sort out all the different technologies that are available. I don't know if anyone followed the Ajax libraries that exist on the planet. You can't even go to sleep without a new library popping up. Because everybody's not working on Ajax, and everybody tries to simplify the Ajax. And um, so you, you need definitely to know what you want to do. Second question What is the expected lifetime for that? <coughs> now, am I ready to dump my application next year? Or would I have to carry it for the next 10 years? Now, if I would have to carry it for the next 10 years, what would need to be done by the application? Well, one thing is easy. Well, I need to extend it. There will be more functionality added, yes, for sure. But then, do I need to move it to another technology stack? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, then, might there be a more clever integration to be required, like SOA integration? Now, what is the expected life cycle? And what do I need to put into the integration layer? Third question. How do you like low-level coding? Are you the geek who spends the weekend and Sunday on just uh, figuring out how the XML HTTP object should be passed around? Are you the one who really loves uh, to figuring out what other browser different? <coughs> now, if you're such a guy, I say yes, I go for the most plain, simplistic approach. Otherwise, you would say, no, find me a way that makes it easier to make. And then, how productive do you need to be? Now, what is the deadline for the project? Is it in 10 years? then you have all the time you need. If you get paid, you pay for the 10 years. If you have next week, you're in big, big trouble. You should leave right now, because you have no job to do. So my assumption here is that complexity, and age of this complexity, at least the low-level programming is complexity, is best time of our So now, based on all the analysis, there are much more questions to ask. One question would be skill level. Have you any clue about Java? Do you have any clue about .NET? Uh, what would be the area where you need to have education? Yeah. So, once you come to that, you look for an abstraction layer, for something that simplifies that. Do I need to see the XML HTTP object? Now, what was the last time when you drove on a freeway when you thought about how the engine worked in your car? Do you ever think about that? You know how I drive? Steering with here, <laughs> right from there. I don't care. The only thing and that's what I do is I change the abstraction layer. I used to have Audi in the past, now I have a Volkswagen. That's my abstraction layer. I still do the same thing, right? And this part is doing this, what I said. actually I would expect it to do. 
just when it's way ahead, right? So I believe the XMI view reflex object is something that we are subtract from the business view. There are always a group of people that need to understand the details about the business application developers. I don't see why they need to understand that. So Java surfaces in 60 seconds. The idea was to go away from markup driven to web application development, go to component driven. I think the course has lifted so that the model gets updated, right? So that is automated. You don't have to put any kind of scriptlet or JavaScript onto the text field just to recognize that, oh yes, the user entered a new value, and by the way, it's a wrong value, so I need to alert him for that. So that's all uh, in the event model. Tooling. The idea was to provide a way for vendors like Oracle to provide an open environment that you could take, put any kind of JSAP library into it, and then work with it. Because the tool would understand how the uh, component works. It would be able to show you the properties, it would allow you to drag and drop the component. Good news is it's a standard, which I think is always a fair uh, reason to go with something uh, like Java Surfaces, because you want to have maturity. So you don't want to see a technology coming in 2008 going away in 2009, because that would bring you into some kind of problem, right? Especially if you have to maintain the application for a couple of more years. So Java Surfaces seems to be just Fine. In the end, you are doing markup, no push development. So you're using components because a JSF component lives within a JSP file or a JSPF file. Unless you write your own view handler to change it to a JSF file, which doesn't exist. So you have some JSP or JSPX text. In this case, this is just the reference implementation. There are different component sets available outside. There's ADA phase which Oracle has as a reference implementation coming from Sun. There's tree in that, which is an Apache open source project. You have JMarty and so on. So different sets. There's also another Apache project, Tomahawk. They all provide components what they think developers need. You see there's an input text. There's a flag or a property set that this is required, which means when the user steps out, there should be an error message shown if there's no value in it. And here you see there's an expression language string that points to a bean on the server side to get the data. And if you change the data, the update the data. The more complex model is what the Java server faces model is. So first of all, every component is a UI component. The UI component by itself doesn't know how it renders. The button is so stupid, it doesn't know how it looks in the browser. But it doesn't need to. It needs to know that if you press it, there's some action it has to do. Then you have the expression language, which is kind of the binding layer. It's a kind of scripting notation that you use just to link the model, in this case the managed B, to the UI component. Because somewhere you have to store the data, you have to keep the data. And then whatever you like here to uh, handle the business logic. If it's straight JDBC, which you can do, or if it's a EGB, if it's a web service that you want to call. So that's up to you. In the end, it might end up in a database. So how does that map to my view? So the root of everything is the view tag. You can't have Java server faces running without that tag. If you remove that, your application stops working, and you know why. Then I have UI component that is the input text. And this one actually uses expression language to get its value from the managed B. When I run it, and I look at the page, the page code, I see plain HTML, some kind of complex HTML, nested HTML, but you don't see the component itself. So it gets, all at the fly, rendered into HTML. And that is what it used to render. Remember the render kit? It's responsible for rendering the component. And this is a hook to how we get into agents. Just keep that in mind for a second. Now, my boss gave me a dollar if I put this slide on. So he's my boss. <laughs> and he's right on that one, so I wouldn't take the, have, have taken the dollar without him being right. Now, if you, if you start working with components, then it's up to the component vendor or deliverer or builder to make sure that your application can be transported to the next generation of whatever UI it is. Now in the Java server faces case, if I use a UI component who knows nothing about its rendering, knows it's a text field, that's all it knows. Now if we use web today, then it would render as a web application. If I would have a telnet render, which in fact we have, it would render as a command line tool. Now if I go to Ajax, I just swap out the render. If in the next year we will have holographic interfaces, yeah, 
and there's a specific UI language for that, we we'll just swap out the rendering conditions. So chances are very good you can keep your work without redoing it, which is what I'm also meaning with how long does your application have to live and where do you have to take it here. At some point, your manager might say, well, it's nice that my application runs on the browser, and I will make it work on the mobile client. So now you don't want to redo your development, you want to just pull out the UI. So this is where we get now into Ajax and Java server spaces. So we know Ajax is just a combination of DHTML, JavaScript, and all of the funky stuff that we've ever wanted. And we know Java server spaces is just kind of a component-based framework that allows me to build applications the way I want and just use a component for everything. For traditional web application developers, it's a bit difficult to understand how to build the app because you're so, so much used to using a table and in the table, put the text up there, the button there, the image there, it always renders nice. If it doesn't render nice, you start it there, start it there, start it there, right? Now, the change of the thinking is that now you're thinking components. Anybody else is a swing developer again? Okay, swing developers always suffer, suffer that same experience or suffer from that same experience because they had to use the layout managers. The layout managers had a behavior. So there was a border layout, for instance, that had five regions. You drop a component, Depending on the reason you put it in there, you can move from one to one layout. You couldn't say, just move and pick through the right, because the layout manager wasn't doing that. Similar in JSON. You have components that have a specific layout behavior. If you want to have a different behavior than they show you by default, you would have to nest different components. Just build your own grid and then drop the component. So, what we think is that developers who build pure Ajax will build themselves into a performer. Because they are kind of not able to move away from the technology. The best example would be, now we are all building Ajax applications. What if the future speaks Flash? Or what if the future speaks some other technology? You build Ajax, that's it. You stick with Ajax. And you can live with the application for a couple of years, but wondering how happy your customers if you can't move the application. JSM is now fraction layer. Now for us that means, you have a set of APIs that you learn, and once you understood how that internally works, that's it. So you're not dealing with anything new based on the technology or the user interface that you use. So, biggest <coughs> reason why is Java Surface is really good for Ajax? First one is the standard. So we have kind of we can be sure that it doesn't really change too much or that it goes away from the So it will be there. It's part of JQE or Java EDS as it's say yet. Huge vendor base. So it's not only Oracle working on Java server faces, IBM and all the big companies looking at Java server faces. It combines a client side implementation and server side technology. <coughs> so you can have client side logic within uh, Java server faces. It's just a matter of the architecture that you choose. It provides a single set of APIs and it goes beyond of browser support. So I know that 99.9% of all applications you most likely build will be browsers initially. You never know what comes next. So better prepare for that. JavaScript is not exposed to the uh, Java surfaces development. So more or less the UI component itself encapsulates the JavaScript. Not that we hide away the development from JavaScript. So good frameworks and good architectures always give you access to the JavaScript. To provide your clients that framework where you can use your JavaScript, maybe you have your favorite Dojo library, which does a trick that you really like to use in your web application and then it feeds back to the JSF lifecycle. Yeah. So it should be exposed. So there should be an option for your JavaScript to go into it. But the goal is every developer should be able to write an agent application without hacking a, a JavaScript. There are some examples today, JMarky, Backbase, iSpaces, there's a there's a website, www.jsfmatrix, I think it's what, what com, jsfmatrix.com, I think it is, where someone sat down initially for an article he wrote for the server side, trying to evaluate which library is doing what type of agent for me. And that was so popular that the matrix now is growing and growing, and every vendor is working with this guy who's sitting in Austria, by the way, and so getting him to extend his matrix so for developers to look now. This is not right? Now we come back to one of my slides where I say, get clear on what you really need in your application. You say, okay, that's my requirement. I need to have a tree, I need a tree table, I need a split canvas, I need to have an accordion. So then you just go to the matrix saying, yeah, this, 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 this would be my option. Now which one do I get for free? 
Any phases which fly will occur in VR technology preview that will be released with JWF 11 when we go production. So just to give you a fast forward on what we're doing, um, we make the whole component that is made to make agents easier. The background is that we have a huge set of developers in the house building Oracle application standard software. And they built that on a new agent. So they decided to go J2E and they have to have something very interactive in the cloud. So we have a very big customer side inside of Oracle, but we have a very big interest in getting this to work very solid and very easy. Because not all of them are propeller agents. They understand the business. They know exactly how human resource works. I don't know. I know how agents work. I don't know anything about human resources. So they do that. So now how can I bring my technology level to them in a way that they build human resource applications without really knowing the ingredients of agents? So we don't need to require any client side installation. So this is why we decided for agents with the JavaScript uh, implementation, because that allows us to download this to the browser. It's integrated in the JSF life cycle. So the request life cycle in Java server place automatically handles different stuff for me, like applying a request permit. I don't need to look up the permit of a request just to make sure the right field get updated. So I don't have to do that. It also um, raises um, alerts for me if there's an error or an exception. It's all taken care of for me. So I don't have to deal with that. And most importantly, you don't need to know about the XML HP request function. So everything you do within that framework will be through the framework, which is always good to do. If you decide for any kind of framework, always try to find something in the framework, don't try to work around. So let me show you a set of components that we created for, before I go into showing you how to build an application. So there's a, a demo site that also is live on OTN and that we will update um, as we update the product. that lists all the ADF faces UI components for you to test online. So you can play with it, you can see what it's doing, so before even using it, you can see so what, what other components you are doing. And you will see that the ADF faces are rich client components, it comes with more than 100 components, starting from very simple components like a button, like a text field, up to more complex components like a table, which of course needs to have some kind of behavior up to a calendar, select item, spinner controls, and everything that actually we know from uh, desktop application development. So just firing up the application, and what you see actually is built in the same component set. So we're not giving you a web page where we show our components without using our components. We, we eat our own dog food. So I guess that many other companies also use their own stuff to present their demos, but in this case, this is fully written with the AFS. So, first thing that's always very impressive to do is to change the look and feel. So, let's go for. Why is that lovely? So, one of the things we can do within the JS app stack is we can just change the skin, the look and feel of the application without touching it. And you can do that on the fly. Now, in theory, for instance, or only in theory, practice as well. Uh, I could go and write an application that looks like the nationality of the guy who comes, where he comes from, right? Uh, you like green, white, red, but I have black, red, and yellow. These are the national flag. So if I come to your web page and you identify me as a German, right, you can show everything in black, red, and yellow. So watching it, swip, uh, swapping it on the fly, or even uh, use style sheet in the skins to rearrange some of these colors, just to make them look different. Right aligned would be possible as well. You can detect on the fly if that requires right, uh, right and left reading and so on. So that's one of the advantages that we have here. Another one is if we go to the tech guide, that's a full list of the text that we have. Let me categorize them a bit so they become easier to understand. Now, the most obvious components you want to have are things like dialogues. Here I can have dialogue, it's a custom button. And you see on the right hand side, you see, for a moment, no longer see that. 
right inside there was a splitter with a property palette that I could online play with the component, I could set width, height, values, and so on. So that's my entire plot going. Ah, stupid as I am. I always look at the link there on the bus. You see, this is a pop up dialog that comes from the table in it. And you will see it's not a, a window that we put on top, it's just a DHTML dialog. Now, you wouldn't work like that. You wouldn't just uh, use JavaScript to build the DHTML for that. You would just use the component for it. I'll show you something. Go for info about Netflix, not a huge thing. That's a simple pop up. Now, what do you want to do, for instance? Share pop up. So, if I give a quote to Jane, Jane is a hacker. So, now the next time I move over Jane, you see there's Jane is a hacker. You didn't see the page refresh because there's communication you can have on the JSON live site without putting in JavaScript that replaces the information in that without reloading. So let's see if I, well, one thing that most developers like, which text editing, where where people actually see the markup assets by the and save it that way. Now that is something that you get as a JSON component, you drag and drop it, use expression language to bind it to a value, and then the functionality is just there. You're not building it yourself. <coughs> or what I showed before, let me go to the file explorer, where you have something more sophisticated. So I have an image here, let's move the image to another folder, so it's emptied here, it's better than there. Right. So this kind of desktop experience, and the good thing is, you're not coding it in JavaScript, you're not trying to get the JSON object to parse it, you will get a notification on the server side in Java server basis, and then you decide what to do with it. So whenever I drag and drop something, it tells me what I can do with it. Plus, now we come to the JavaScript script friends here. If I want to do something on the client side, I want to really use JavaScript on the client. And there are some use cases that are better to be handled on the client than on the server, especially if you want to avoid a server run trip. There is a complete set of JavaScript APIs that's hosted by the framework that you can work to access individual components, to read the values, write the values, to prevent drag and drop, to highlight drag, tar uh, drop targets, and so on. So that was, for me, the easy part demo, the next step after showing you some more slides would be where I show you how you build that. Just to give you a, a quick impression of how the building is done. Now let me talk a bit about how we do the actual implementation. So we have a client side that we must have. So that is the HTML, XML, HTTP request, there's an abstract component model, and there's a data <coughs> So we actually keep track of the data that we have on the client side, so we're not really asking for every single data as it comes if we already have it on the it's not a persistent cache, it's just a temporary cache for the page, as long as the page lives. Then, we also provide you with deferred loading. As I mentioned, if you have a table with a thousand records, you don't want to load the thousand records on the client just to scroll, so you won't have them loading deferred. On the server side, we use the JSP syntax just to have JSF components in there. Plus, we enhance the JSF lifecycle to handle partial page refresh. Because it's not a full request that you send, it's just a partial request and that needs some kind of special treatments that you can then handle on the server side using this technology. So, how do we get there? So that's the picture pretty much as I showed it to you. So we still have our text field, UI component, expression language, managed theme. To get from there to Ajax, we have the expression language, Managed theme, in this case, we use ADF for the binding because that is another interesting topic to cover where we'll talk about uh, on Friday when we talk about enhancing JSA, um, that instead of you handcrafting the business service access, there must be something smart, intelligent that allows you to do that with drag and drop. And that is what Oracle ADF does. So we have the binding object here. The I component, now all that we have is we have an AG2NF to 
And that, instead of doing plain HTML, renders you this Ajax framework. This is just the buying framework and whatever you put underneath. This side doesn't really care because this side talks to JSF. JSF via the model updates talks to the business service. If you want, you could start with EGV3.0. After some time, you don't like it, you swap it out, use web service and so on. So you have a very nice operation on the service layer as well. This is one example of a prototype that was built in-house. Another layout where it just changes the skin. The two applications are basically the same. It's just that it changes the skin and the imaging. Now let me show you how we actually build the application. So what I start with is I have a... Oh, I should have had a database-driven model. So let me create that quickly. So one of the one of the technologies we provide within uh, Oracle is AFUSES Components. This is a framework that is used by Oracle applications as well, which which is addressing the 4GL type of developers coming from a non-Java data background. Now those that are really familiar with the Java of J2E, they might go for JTA so the Java for this architecture needs to be. So this is mostly declarative, so you don't see me doing any fancy coding. But you see me pushing some wizards and then I get my master data centralization, at least for the default basic functionality of the application. Level. So connected to my database. Do I mention which database I use? Um, but it, it works with any database. It's just, uh, it requires a SQL 92 drive, a compliant driver uh, if you use another database. But in my case, I don't need that for the obvious reason. So just pick three categories and I want to work with that. Build a simple application based on that. <coughs> I could, to this point in time, I could already test my model because there's a uh, generic Java applet that we generate out of what we build here. So I could in my business service development, start mm -hmm. testing my business logic, but this talk is about Ajax, so let's build an Ajax application. So I started with a JSF project. So you see a faces config file, which is a JSF configuration file. Uh, we extended this for task flows, so to be able like to instruct to navigate not only from one page to another page, but also from a page to a method call. We extended the Java server faces uh, behavior with an extension. We don't have to use that just to get AJ faces working. So let's create a browse page. Browse AJ. So I start filling my, my empty page, just making sure we use the same. Okay. Just making sure that it's using a JSPX page for that. Come with an empty canvas. All that it set for me is the view root, which I mentioned must be in a JSF application for the JSF application to work. And the rest now is declarative. In the end, we will see something Ajax like, but I'm not coding JavaScript. I see me coding JavaScript slapping in my hands, but from one at a time, not all of them, not all at once, right? So, let's. So one of my of the benefits of using ADF binding is that I can also do the data binding with drag and drop, not wasting your time on showing how I build that. So let's start with the splitter screen. So panel splitter that I put into the form. So the panel splitter is just there, you know, to have two areas that independently can be moved. One can collapse. And in here, I now drag and drop some Ajax components. So first of all, I start with a panel collection. I will show you what the panel collection does later on. Um, there is a lot of magic in the panel collection. It's just a shelf that expects you to put a table in a tree and on a tree table. In. And this brings you a menu sort of thing with fantastic functionality. One is just detaching it. So you have a table with 100 columns, which is uh, Nice to scroll, but hard to edit. Now you want to have it jump out of your back, right? 
just taking the full browser page. And on the next click on the button, you'll have it drawn back where it comes from. This is the functionality of that. So let's do my apartments table in here as a table. So row selection, filtering, sorting, all is over one. So the next step for me would be to create an edit form for that. So put that into the, the other panel, have a submit button. Now so far the two components doesn't really lose the real place really. So far that would be unrelated. So there would be no synchronization between the two parts. So if I would scroll in the table, nothing would happen to the edit form. So I need to require that up as you would do when you build edits. So what we use is a technology called partial page rendering. Um, it's only called because for historical reasons when we started building uh, more interactive applications, we called it partial page rendering. So we stick with the term, not to confuse existing customers. So if I go on a table, then I have a behavior property for the table, and one of its properties is called partial trigger. I go to edit, and now I can browse my page structure. And what I'm going to do is whenever an update to a form is done, I want the table to refresh. So I'm looking for my form, which sits in the, in the second area of this panel splitter. Here's my button. I give it an ID. Let's call it submit button. Move it over. So what this does is that under the shelf, whenever I press the button, the table gets refreshed, and only the table. Vice versa, I want to have the form to be updated when I navigate within the table. So for this, what I do, the form has a container which is called panel form layout. So think of what I told you about layout containers. So this container it contains components, it's child components. So for this, I do exactly the same. I go to behavior partial triggers, and this time I need to make the, um, the table the trigger object. So it's my first, so there's a panel collection that needs an ID. Whatever that is, I can just make it up. It just needs to be unique. And in here I have my table. Let's call it table one. I move it over, and that's it. Whenever I do something with the table, the form gets refreshed. So, if I did it right, then if I run the application, you should see an Ajax experience with an application. And you didn't see me configure JavaScript. I swear I only hope I could do it, but I'm not doing it. So the goal is not really to say Ajax uh, JavaScript is bad. Well, Ajax is good, JavaScript is good as well. But we try to avoid uh, JavaScript as good as we can. We always say, Try to find it in the framework what you're looking for. If you can't find it in the framework, look into JavaScript, new manual agent. Try to avoid having parallel sessions, because that's one of the problems that you're facing when you work with AJAX. If you have parallel sessions, they're not synchronized. The life cycle is different. Good is that with an AFX switch client, you have the ability to queue a request into the life cycle. So if you have a I mentioned the Dojo library, you have something that you get from Dojo, maybe you have the ability on a client to access the web service, to get some information from the web service, from the client, so you want to pass it back as a search criteria to the server, and you can do that. There's a queuing mechanism in any cases that allows you. So, uh, damn. Let me check my partial. Oh, it's good. There's one student. They will refresh by the submit button. Let's see what this says. Move it and push it back again. So 
before going to this part of the demo, I'll show you the kind of like a mix that I know you um, So I'm not sure why that was for the game that. If it still doesn't work, I have a fallback. Every presenter has a fallback, right? So you get a much on the answer again. Back. Just to do the panel collection part and filtering first, just to show you what the filtering is doing. So the filtering, that are the fields that you see here. There are edits to the component. I can switch it off and on. So in here I can say just show me, show me everything that has an S in it, and then it goes and doesn't in memory go anymore. It doesn't go back to the data. So it just shows you what what it already has. Then this is what I meant was it jumps out of this bag. So you, you have the full size of the table that you can work with without having to code that. I also get for free the ability to take a column and move it to another place. I also have the ability to say on a column level that a specific column shouldn't be movable, which case it always takes fixed. That makes sense if you have a table with 30 columns and the first one always gives you the name, so you always need to know the context where if you have a horizontal scrolling where the context is. So you can do that there as well. I can also say, okay, organize or hide columns. So don't show me the department ID. While still the data is there, it's just hidden from the user. Uh, reorder columns are there as well. I showed you the test as well. Let's try my a partial page trigger. So let's rename administration. So that's supposed to change this guy. So let's press submit. And this time that works. You see it just refreshing to the table and that's this kind of Let me try the other way around now as well. Ah, you see. You do it wrong because people like like seeing presenters sweating. <laughs> and uh, once you did that, you could you could run through it. You see, <laughs> hey, Ajax, I did my Ajax, um, and that brings me to a quote that I don't get a dollar for, but it's for me. Where I say, well, any face which client is Ajax for everyone. We learn our faces, as you hopefully have done already, and that brings you to the Ajax world. Buying you a lot of time while you work with job service, building your Ajax stack, you keep on uh, looking into how the framework works, expanding the framework, extending the framework maybe with your own component set or with JavaScript. And that's it. So I'm well in time. So I know I'm competing with lunch only. So if you want to have lunch, go there. If you have questions, I can take that. I should have told you that that's fun. <laughs> Good boy. Anyway, so a bit of advertising. On Friday, I have two sessions here. One session is about uh, J2E development, where we'll also talk a bit about JZ, less about Ajax, where we'll just show you the JLF and what are the options for the, for the developers that like to try to work with JPA, PGP, web service, and what do we have in the stack for that. Plus, so a very large presentation today for the party, which is similar to competing this month, is um, about enhancing our cases, which also plays into the whole Ajax mood. Uh, there are some extensions that we put into JDFR Latin and AJAX cases just to enhance the JDFR cases so to make it more suitable for Ajax. Anyway, thanks for attending. Have a good conference.